Hey carnivores, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. So I thought I would sit outside, enjoy the gorgeous Seattle weather while it lasts. It's been consistently warm and sunny and bright these days, and I know that it's not going to be forever, so I've been really taking advantage of this gorgeous weather, doing work outside, chilling outside, spending time with my dogs, and I wanted to multitask today and film a video talking about some things that hopefully will help you guys along your journeys. So I always aim to share things that I have learned with my own experience uh, after troubleshooting or experimenting with certain things, ingredients, foods. I am so passionate about sharing my updates about the data that I've learned um, about things that I have experienced in hopes of helping you guys improve your carnivore journeys and progress a little bit smoother and quicker. Before I deep dive into today's video, I did want to first ask all of you guys to comment down below an update. Let me know how your carnivore progress is going. Have you noticed any changes, positive victories, or are you struggling with anything in particular? Let me know down below. So today's video will focus on foods that I have experimented with, and I will be explaining in depth what foods tend to cause what issues and how to resolve it. I will always give replacements, swaps for the problematic foods, and resolutions on how to avoid the symptoms, the negative impacts that these specific carnivore foods give me. If you are a complete carnivore newbie and you are completely new to this lifestyle, you've just started or you're currently slowly transitioning into the end goal of full carnivore, I think that the details and info that I share in this video would be helpful to you down the line. And why I say that is because I want my new carnivores to fully enjoy their carnivore experience. I want every single meal that you guys sit down to eat to be enjoyable, palatable, flavorful, and delicious. The last thing that I want is for you guys to overthink things or to worry that, you know, every little thing that you're eating may be causing every little issue that you may be going through right now. When a new carnivore adapts to this lifestyle, the adaptation phase can encompass a lot of issues. A lot of these experiments that I have done for myself, I've done after fully adapting to the carnivore diet. My first few months of eating carnivore, I really focused on eating what I craved, what I found to be delicious, what I was excited excited to eat. So I just want to say this for my newbie newbie carnivores who just started or who are still transitioning to not worry too much about each specific ingredient that you're eating. I think the biggest thing that you can do for your body and for your goals is to just prioritize consistently sticking to the carnivore diet. So if that means you need to lean on variety and you need to lean on certain foods, including foods that I will mention in this video, I think you should prioritize eating those foods for the sake of enjoying the lifestyle for now. After you're adapted and fully comfortable and confident with this lifestyle, then you can start troubleshooting, experimenting, taking out one ingredient at a time, adding in a new ingredient. I think that's the wisest thing to do because we want to see this lifestyle not as a quick fix, you know, hack or fad diet. This is a way of life. So I want you guys to do every step uh, seamlessly, slowly, and at your own pace. So this video is really great for those who are ready to troubleshoot, who are kind of fully adapted and wondering why some issues are still happening. So the first carnivore food that I wanna open up with that could be problematic for you is eggs. Now with eggs, I know that a lot of you guys are wondering, oh my gosh, but eggs are such a popular carnivore food. It is so versatile. How could eggs be problematic? From my personal experience, egg whites can cause digestion problems. Problems. When I first went carnivore, I was looking to heal a lot of autoimmune concerns. Most of them were skin related like psoriasis, eczema, um, cystic and hormonal acne, and rosacea. So all of these autoimmune skin concerns made me more sensitive to the little things even if they were carnivore. The egg whites gave me digestion issues. They also caused my eczema to flare up and itch. How did I pinpoint that the issues that I was experiencing was coming from egg whites? So here's another tip. I experimented and I only experimented with one variable at a time. So I remember in the beginning when I was, you know, experiencing a worsening of my eczema, I was doing the research, I was learning more about the carnivore lifestyle, I definitely was looking into oxalate dumping as well, and I am for sure positive that oxalate dumping was going on my first few months of carnivore. But I was also looking for quick solutions to at least lessen the itchiness, the flare-ups, and I found that the egg whites 
specifically when cut out helped my itching of the skin and it prevented me from scratching in the middle of the night. And if you are interested in experimenting with one ingredient at a time, I do want to emphasize that doing it with one variable at a time is extremely crucial. If you experiment with more than one variable, for example, you cut out egg whites, but at the same time you add in a new ingredient, then you would probably be confused by whether or not a positive impact you felt was from cutting out the egg whites or from that new food that you added in. So always give each variable you want to experiment with its own dedicated time. And how long should you experiment? I would say two weeks minimum is a safe amount to really make sure that what you're feeling is real. I would take out the egg whites, give it two weeks of not eating egg whites at all, but also don't change anything else that you're doing and eating in your life. And then after the two weeks, I would actually add in the egg whites to see if those issues come back. Usually it's the egg yolks that are the most gentle. It is high fat, it is the most nutrient dense part of the egg. So I would really try modifying the recipes that you love that include eggs to cut out the egg whites, but still keep the egg yolks. I see a lot of my autoimmune healers make my egg pudding recipe without the egg whites and only with egg yolks and their liquid of choice. You can actually do that for the egg pudding easily. Just keep the ratio of just yolk to liquid of choice, steam it up, and that is a very, very gentle and nourishing recipe right there. Another thing that I've learned is what are you cooking those eggs with? Are you cooking your eggs with a lot of rendered melted hot fats? and animal fats, animal cooking oils. For example, if you are a big lover of scrambled eggs and you're experiencing bloat, gas, indigestion, or loose stools, here are some things to really pick apart and analyze. It could be the egg whites, or it could be the amount of hot melted fats that you are adding into that scrambled egg dish. If you're kind of new to carnivore or you're still adapting, hot rendered cooked fats are one of the biggest culprits for popular issues like loose stools, explosive diarrhea, unpredictable loose stools and diarrhea, bloating, gas, indigestion, digestive issues in general. Rendered cooked hot fats is so very difficult for your body to digest and absorb, especially if you're new. Initially, I had such horrible digestion and digestive problems like loose stools for such a prolonged period of time. For me, it was like three, four months of loose stools. I was coming from a diet, the vegan diet, of zero fats, barely any fats, very, very high carb, extremely fibrous foods. So you can imagine upon going into the carnivore diet where there's zero fiber, zero carbs, that my body did have a very hard time digesting and absorbing all that fat. So one tip that I can offer you all if you're having loose stools is to, instead of cooking scrambled eggs and having all that hot cooked melted fats, butters, whatever animal fat you use to scramble your eggs with, swap it with egg salad, fatty egg salad, okay? So how to make fatty egg salad, I'll probably put an insert of a quick demo, but it is a much easier way to eat eggs, digest the fat and absorb all of the nutrients. Here's a quick demo and recipe of the egg salad. You're just going to need hard boiled eggs and butter. Of course, you can swap the butter for ghee or whatever fat you love and can tolerate. So you just mash the boiled eggs with the butter. And note that the butter that I'm using is not melted. It's not cooked. It is not hot. It is solid butter. And that is what's going to make a world of a difference in digestion in absorption and not having to run to the toilet with loose stools. I used to make this egg salad all the time when I was studying at Juilliard, going to school, spending the whole day at school. I would pack a bunch of fatty AF egg salad, put it in a lunchbox, chilled, or just leave it in my locker and eat it throughout the day. Yes, the issue may be the eggs, it may be the egg white specifically, or it may very well be the whole entire egg. But don't forget that we often cook that egg ingredient with other ingredients too. So if you're eating a lot of hot cooked rendered fats, it's also worth an experiment to swap out those melted hot fats with solid room temperature chilled fats. From my experience and from so many carnivores in my community, in the steak and butter gang, I have just seen and heard over and over again that cold, solid, room temperature fats are so much easier to digest and absorb than melted, hot, cooked, and rendered fats. Not only does it improve the digestion, it also prevents nausea, 
meat aversion, heartburn, acid reflux. I would really swap out any hot cooked rendered fats for instead cold, chilled, even frozen solid fats. And speaking of the steak and butter gang, if you're new to the carnivore diet, you're new to my YouTube channel, you're really enjoying all the info that you're learning, or you're just really intrigued to learn more, uh, I highly recommend that you guys come join my off social media community called the Steak and Butter Gang. So many of you guys, my viewers, requested for a private group where people can post questions, where people can discuss common issues, trends, concerns, and we can all connect over the carnivore lifestyle. It's also a great place to stay accountable because I have chat boxes up and running all day long, 365 days a year, so that no matter what time of day or where you are in life, you can just hop into that chat box, express your concerns, ask a question, ask for help, and get the help and answers you need. It is also a wonderful source of inspiration because so many of my members are currently experiencing victories, changes, results, and they share their before and after photos, their progress pics in the Steak and Butter Gang. And for all the members who are there, it is an extreme source of inspiration. We cheer each other on. So if you want to be a part of a loving, supportive family of meat eaters who just want to get healthy, look amazing, and feel fantastic, go to sbgmeetup.com or click the link down below to learn more about the Steak and Butter Gang and all the support it has to offer. Second carnivore food, this one is more of a food group that I have to address and share with you everything that I have learned, is dairy. And dairy as a whole food group encompasses so many different um, carnivore consistencies, textures. I can tell you that dairy is a huge hit or miss food category for us carnivores. Now I'm gonna start off with one food that I think is an exception, the biggest exception of all, and that is butter. Butter is a full fat carnivore food. It is pure fat. And when we eat pure fat, we experience some amazing benefits like satiation, no longer having sugar cravings. The benefits of butter is whenever I had a bout of sugar cravings, and I know for a fact that when you go carnivore and you really go into strict carnivore without any more carbs, vegetables, sugars, and you're like all in, you will experience withdrawals and it's really your gut and your stomach talking, your second brain telling you or convincing you that you need sugar, otherwise you cannot survive. So those types of thoughts and those sugar craving voices can sometimes be so strong, so unbearable, so unavoidable. And guess what? The thing that I learned was that when I experienced those unavoidable, strong cravings and those voices just literally in my ear, telling me that I need sugar, I would eat a bite of butter and it would simply just drift away. If it doesn't drift away, just eat more butter. And if it takes three bites of butter, four slivers of butter, a whole stick of butter, your voices of craving for sugar will eventually go away. It's a hack and a tactic that I recommend to anyone and everyone who comes to me asking, what can I do to kill sugar cravings? And my answer will always be eat some butter. As simple and crazy as it sounds, it's something to try. Eat some butter every time you have a sugar craving and update me on how you feel. When I first started carnivore diet, I had no cycle zero, no periods. And I didn't have it for quite a few years before that because I was vegan for six years total and it just completely wrecked my hormones. And because I ate so much fat, I leaned on the butter. I ate at least one to two sticks of butter every single day upon starting carnivore. I was able to regain my cycle very quickly. I thought that my stomach was truly a bottomless pit and I would eat myself until I exploded. That didn't happen, clearly. Our human bodies are very smart. It will tell us when we are satiated, especially if we're eating proper human diet foods, like meat, like anything animal foods. Butter, I feel like, is the reason why I was able to rebalance and heal my wrecked hormones so quickly and effectively. And it is hands down the reason why I was able to regain my period in less than three months. So I really think if you're female and you have hormonal issues, you're feeling cranky, you snap at your kids for no reason, or you have a cycle, but you experience extreme PMS symptoms, please give high fat, specifically eating more butter a try because there is just something magical and deeply healing about 
butter. And for my sensitive carnivores who cannot tolerate butter, right, who have issues with those little minimal traces of lactose, something that you can try out instead is ghee. G-H-E-E -E is how it's spelled, and I'll spell it out on the screen. I'll also show you my favorite ghee that I have in my refrigerator every single day. Ghee is easier to digest because it is basically clarified butter. So any trace amounts of lactose is removed and clarified. Anytime that I see any grocery store offering raw and unpasteurized dairy, it just makes my day because that's how big of a difference raw dairy makes when it comes to, you know, bloat gas, digestion issues, even weight issues. What is the difference and how do I tell the difference between the two? Well, I would just say any grocery store dairy product is automatically pasteurized dairy. The fact that raw unpasteurized dairy is illegal in so many states will tell you just how rare that type of food is. Every time I go to California, I stock up like crazy on my favorite raw kefir, raw cheeses, raw butter, raw dairy, everything. And that's really the only state that I have been able to find those products with ease. All pasteurized dairy is going to be automatically more difficult to digest, more difficult to absorb those nutrients, and it's going to be more prone to give you bloat, gas, digestion issues, skin issues, especially like pimples, acne, breakouts, rosacea. It will also probably make your autoimmune skin disorders like eczema and psoriasis worse. So pasteurized dairy can be a very, very dangerous food, especially for my sensitive carnivores who have a lot of autoimmune issues that they want to heal. Please don't give up on your hunt on raw unpasteurized dairy products. And my tips to find raw unpasteurized butter is to just do a quick Google search, raw dairy near me. Local farms will most likely pop up on your results feed and you can literally call each local farm to personally ask if they sell any raw dairy products. And if so, what type of products, how much, when are they open? It is always worth the time and effort to inquire and call each local farm because that's actually how I was able to find amazing raw dairy products when I used to live in New York City. Back to the cheese uh, topic. Raw cheese versus pasteurized cheese. Those two different types of cheeses alone, I have also personally experienced differences in digestion, in the way that my body reacts, in the way that my skin reacts the next morning, two mornings after. So I would actually allot, again, two weeks just to experiment with raw cheese and then with pasteurized cheese to see if it makes a difference in your digestion, in your skin, in your healing journey. Let's move on to another popular dairy product and that is yogurt. So <laughs> yogurt is something that I love. I just love the consistency, that creamy, thick texture of yogurt. It's a food that I've always loved since I was a kid. My favorite raw dairy product is kefir because the tanginess, the sour, refreshing, chilled component of yogurt and kefir is something that I cherish and adore so much. Raw yogurt, raw kefir will always be superior to pasteurized yogurt and pasteurized kefir. Why? Again, because it is easier to digest. It will not cause skin reactions like breakouts, pimples, hormonal acne. It's going to be actually beneficial and supportive of your healing journey because there are so many amazing probiotics, enzymes, and bacteria that is still alive that will aid in your digestion, that will aid in helping you transition and adapt to carnivore quickly and smoothly. And on the other hand, pasteurized yogurt and pasteurized kefir to me is just like a dead product. Absolutely no benefits at all unless you can find a pasteurized high full fat yogurt. Then yes, that could be very beneficial to make sure that you're always staying satiated, that you have foods that are easy to pack and you know bring on the go that are high fat, satiating and nourishing. If you can only find pasteurized yogurt and kefir and you are really craving for it, find the highest fat pasteurized yogurt you can possibly find. And please check the ingredients always to make sure there are no sneaky ingredients like sugar, stevia, flavorings, natural flavorings sneaked into the ingredients list. Stevia, absolutely not. 
Why? Because stevia has a sweet taste to it. If you incorporate any type of flavors that does taste sweet to your tongue, you are still fueling your sugar cravings, and your sugar cravings and voices telling you that you need sugar will never ever truly go away. And the last dairy product worth mentioning and talking about is milk. So I know milk is such a staple for our kids. I grew up drinking one tall glass of milk every single day, and I actually think that's the reason why I'm the tallest child in my family. I am taller than my parents. I'm taller than all of my siblings. I ate the most meat and I drank the most milk every single day. Um, but when you're an adult and you're not really after growing taller or building the fundamentals of the human body, then I don't think that milk should be a staple in the carnivore lifestyle. Unless you are trying hard to gain weight, you have difficulty gaining weight, and your goal is to gain weight. Anything with gaining weight, gaining muscle, milk can be a huge supportive food to incorporate. And again, the same thing applies to milk. Raw milk is so much more superior to uh, pasteurized milk. Pasteurized milk tends to cause Asians to be lactose intolerant. So I think the reason why Asians are so lactose intolerant is because all of the milk that is sold in grocery stores is naturally pasteurized milk. There is nothing alive. There's nothing beneficial to that milk. It is dead. Everything that is beneficial is killed and heated. So pasteurized milk tends to be the last thing I would ever suggest adding into the diet. And milk is just naturally very high in sugars. It literally tastes sweet, which could be very problematic for our sugar addicts. Drinking milk can easily trigger a whole rabbit hole of wanting all of the sugary foods, all of the creamy junk, like, uh, I'm not even gonna say it, but milk can be a huge trigger because it has a very palatable and sweet flavor profile to it. If you can get your hands on raw unpasteurized milk, you can easily turn that milk product into yogurt, into kefir. You can just let it sit on your counter and let it age so that those sugars will die off and instead age and ferment into something thicker and more delicious and tangy like yogurt and kefir. Seasonings, herbs, even salt and pepper. These types of ingredients that we really don't think much about could also be causing you issues. So the biggest thing that jumps out to me when I think about pepper and seasonings in general is the oxalates. So again, this really mostly applies to my adapted carnivores, not my newbie carnivores, because again, I want my newbie carnivores to enjoy getting into this lifestyle. I want all foods to be palatable, flavorful, seasoned how you like. But if you're three plus months into carnivore and you're still experiencing issues, it could be the pepper. It could be the seasoning. Did you really check every single ingredient in your seasoning? Because a lot of times seasonings will unfortunately sneak nasty ingredients like sugar, like MSG, like dextrose, like additives. All of these types of ingredients could be easily cut out and your body will feel a difference when you stop eating those chemicals. So first check for that. The next thing you can experiment with is cutting out the black pepper. Why? Because black pepper is high in oxalates. And if you do not know what oxalates are, I interviewed the expert of oxalates and oxalate dumping, Sally K. Norton. I'll link that video down below so you guys can understand why oxalates oxalates are so harmful and why they may be triggering the issues you're uh, going through right now. Taking out pepper is worth doing if you have constant runny nose, sinus issues, skin issues, skin flare-ups. If you're experiencing even digestion issues, again, those are really common signs that some ingredient in your carnivore diet is causing you to react. If you absolutely need pepper in your life, you know, the spice of pepper on your meats, then an easy swap is white pepper. So instead of having black pepper on everything, use white pepper instead because it is low in oxalates. Now let's move on to salt. Salt to a lot of carnivores is a staple. It is something that they cannot live without or it is something that they think they cannot live without. A lot of carnivores, you know, uh, promote high salt, heavy salting, eat the salt, put it on your tongue, pour it in your water and guzzle it down. I think we should 
always understand that at the end of the day, our bodies are very individual. We are individual human bodies and we are at very different points of our healing journeys. We also have very individual goals for our body composition, for our fitness goals. So salt to me is something that I learned so much from. When I first started carnivore, I assumed that I had to stock up on all of the fats, the meats, the go-tos, but also the salt. And the heavier I salted, the less I was feeling energetic, the drowsier I felt, the more lethargic I felt. And then I realized, wait a minute, salt is an ingredient in something that I can toggle. So once I started playing around with the quantity of salt that I was having day to day, I started experiencing differences, changes in my energy levels, changes in my mood, how I felt upon waking up in the morning. That is all to me very important. At the end of the day, I want to be the healthiest, the fittest I can be, but I also want to be the most productive, the most mentally clear I could be, the most effective ingredient that has changed those mental feelings for me personally is salt. So whenever I cut down the salt, I immediately would feel higher energy, better mood, less brain fog. And when I intentionally added more salt back into the diet, you know, salted heavily on all my meals, I started feeling brain fog again. I started feeling lethargic again. I felt like I couldn't wake up or get out of bed because I, all I wanted to do was stay in bed and sleep more. Do I think that you all should cut out salt completely? Absolutely not. I think I've made it clear that our bodies are all very individual. So don't listen to what I'm saying even and be quick to assume that, oh my gosh, she's right. I should cut out all salt. That's definitely the culprit. No, don't do that. Again, take two weeks to slowly cut down the salt until it's completely gone. See how you feel for a good week or so without the salt. And then add it back in to really reaffirm if those results and those things that you are feeling are real. These are the best tips and advice that I can offer you. Um, as someone who has been living the carnivore lifestyle for almost four years now. And I think if you take anything away from this video, it is to really experiment and give it time. Do not be quick to assume or be quick to point uh, fingers at any specific ingredient because it could not even be that ingredient that is causing you issues. And I would always stress that if you're gonna experiment with any ingredient or food that you're currently eating, I would do it one at a time. There is no point in experimenting with two different ingredients, whether it be adding it back in or cutting it back out. You wouldn't know what impacts or effects are from which food or which ingredient. I do think that salt is quite crucial to ensure a smooth transition because during the transition from, let's say, standard American diet to carnivore. If carnivore is your end goal, when your body is adapting and transitioning to that end goal, there will be a lot of electrolyte imbalance going on. You're suddenly eating foods that are not as high sodium, probably will experience changes in your thirst levels. If you're going through something like this, I highly recommend really generously salting all of your meats, all of your carnivore meals. But this really applies to just my newer carnivores and for my carnivores who are not yet fully carnivore and going through that transition. Now, if you want something that is measured out for you and that is all inclusive of not just sodium, but also potassium and magnesium, I highly recommend Element electrolytes. So this is what the packaging looks like. It is L-M-N-T spelled out. Element has a raw unflavored version where there is zero stevia and it's really just sodium, potassium and magnesium measured out for you. So it's definitely worth recommending, especially for my new carnivores who want to avoid the headaches, the fatigue, the low energy, the muscle cramps that are oh so common when adapting to the carnivore diet. This is by the way, a full size box. You just rip one open, pour it in whatever beverage you want to drink, water, coffee, whatever it is, pour it in, mix it up, drink it, and you are good to go. If you're sweating a lot, you will probably need to supplement with electrolytes because you're sweating out all of your electrolytes and you're drinking all this water, right? So this is extremely handy. This is what the sample pack looks like and you guys can get a free sample pack with any purchase. Just go to drinklmnt.com slash S-B-G-A-L as shown on the screen. You can also click the link down below for a clickable link. So actually speaking of beverages, this is another thing that I want to talk about that may be causing you upset stomach, issues 
specifically digestive issues. So my camera just died, so I am going to be using my iPhone. This topic and video will need a part two because I only went through like 15% of my list. I just never know how much I'm going to talk in detail. And I'm sure you guys all appreciate it, right? Me going into utmost detail about every single thing and sharing everything that I have learned ever. So um, I'll just film a separate video, a part two of this general topic. But the last thing that I'm gonna wrap up with is beverages. I see a lot of carnivores make the mistake of chugging tons and tons of liquids, water during their mealtime when they're eating very dense high fat foods like ribeye or pork belly. Chugging all that water is not going to create a smooth and enjoyable digestive process after you eat. So if you can help it, I highly suggest that you drink water as minimal as possible. If you feel a dry throat or you just need a little bit of water to wash it down, fine, drink some water. But please try to avoid chugging water down while you're eating your high protein or high fat or both uh, carnivore meals. If you can help it, have most of your water intake before eating and after eating. If you are chugging water just for the sake of trying to fulfill a set amount of water that you feel like you're supposed to be drinking per day for optimal health, that is not a thing. You do not have to drink two gallons of water a day to stay alive and well. That is another myth that we have to unlearn. Just like how, you know, eating animal fats or eating butter will clog your arteries and give you heart attacks. Drinking water is not a vital thing to stay healthy, to be energetic. Um, you will also probably notice when you go carnivore and you're quite adapted to carnivore, you will notice a decrease in general thirst. So if you are already experiencing a decrease in general thirst on the carnivore diet, please stop forcing yourself to drink a designated amount of water a day just because you think it is the right thing to do. We talked about electrolytes, right? The biggest thing that you can do to cause electrolyte imbalance is yes, over salting or eating way too many electrolytes or not eating enough salt, not eating enough electrolytes, but also over hydrating, drinking way too much water. When you're drinking so much water, guess what's happening? You're peeing all that water out. And when you're flushing all of that water out of your system, you're also flushing all of the valuable electrolytes that you're getting in from your meats, your carnivore meals, from whatever you're supplementing with, the salts that you're using. So there is absolutely no reason to overhydrate or drink two gallons of water. So the biggest rule of thumb to go by when you're pretty much adapted to carnivore, I would say, is to drink to thirst. How simple is that? Really, we don't have to overthink anything on carnivore, including hydration. If you're thirsty, you drink. If you're not thirsty, don't drink water. One more thing when it comes to beverages is sparkling water. I often praise sparkling water for having helped me overcome the nausea, the uh, fatty feeling of eating way too much rendered hot cooked fats. It might be worth noting and experimenting when you are having sparkling water. Have you noticed that you often burp after drinking sparkling water? So all of those effects can be the reason why you're having gas, bloat, indigestion. So when are you having sparkling water? Is it all throughout eating and you're chugging sparkling water while you're eating? So same thing, that will mess with digestion. Try to limit sparkling water. Sparkling water is not water. So if you're trying to drink water because you're thirsty, please do not use sparkling water as that beverage to quench your thirst. Okay, my carnivore friends, this is all of the topics and foods and beverages that I will cover today. I will definitely film a part two for the rest of the foods that I have learned to be careful for. But I did want to just emphasize and recap again that all of these ingredients that I mentioned and you know the issues that it may cause, I want you to understand that it is really directed towards my more adapted carnivores, my more experienced carnivores. If you are completely new to this lifestyle, I really do not want you to overthink things, to think that, oh, you know, everything that you're eating or this or that, or maybe this and that, you know, could be causing you issues or it could be uh, preventing you from healing or preventing you from achieving your weight loss. I think as a new carnivore who just started this type of lifestyle, the biggest favor that you can do for yourself 
is to make it as enjoyable as possible. I just want you to get through that initial adaptation phase. Once you're adapted and you got the groove of this lifestyle and you are comfortable, you know, and confident as a carnivore, then you can troubleshoot. Then you can start experimenting. Then you can try out different ideas. But if you're new, please do not make the mistake of bothering your body, of stressing yourself out, of overthinking every little thing, and then causing a burnout after. When you're burnt out and you're so stressed out, guess what happens? You fall off track. You start thinking and assuming that, oh my gosh, carnivore diet is not for you. So the biggest thing you can do for you is to just get over that adaptation period, truly fully adapt, and enjoy your meals. Have fun while you're doing this. Carnivore lifestyle is not a fad diet. It is not a quick fix. This could be something that you can stick to for the rest of your life. Something that you can, you know, give and translate into your kids' meals. Something that you can share with your relatives, with your friends, all of that. But first, focus on yourself. Have fun make it sustainable, try to stick with it and be consistent with it because that will pay off so much more in the long run than dipping your toes in every single little tiny thing. If you loved this video, don't forget to hit like, don't forget to hit subscribe. Please share this video with anyone you think would love it too. And follow me on Instagram for even more carnivore content. So of course I have to wrap up this video with some piano music to help you guys get in the mood. I hope you enjoy the following music performed by yours truly. to the carnivore diet, you're new to my YouTube channel, you're really enjoying all the info that you're learning, or you're just really intrigued to learn more, uh, I highly recommend that you guys come join my off social media community called the Steak and Butter Gang, where people can post questions, where people can discuss common issues. It's also a great place to stay accountable because I have chat boxes up and running all day long, 365 days a year. Ask for help and get the help and answers you need. So many of my members are currently experiencing victories, changes, results, and they share their before and after photos, their progress pics in the Steak and Butter Gang. And for all the members who are there, it is an extreme source of inspiration. We cheer each other on. So if you wanna be a part of a loving, supportive family of meat eaters who just wanna get healthy, look amazing, and feel fantastic, Go to sbgmeetup.com or click the link down below to learn more about the Steak and Butter Gang and all the support it has to offer. Don't forget to hit like, 
subscribe and turn on your bell and notifications. I'm currently playing around with a new platform called Nunu. It gives my audience, my viewers, all of you guys, the power to decide for me what I should do next. And I think this platform could be very beneficial in helping me decide what content to film next, what video topics to post next, what interviews I should do. I'm able to post about super polls, events, and goals, and you guys can all help me make decisions as part of those different types of posts. So it's a fun way to interact with you all more, to give you guys a say in what I should do next, what I should post next, what type of videos and content I should put out next. So feel free to check out my profile, Steak and Butter Gal, on nunu.co. Okay, I hope you guys have a fantastic Gouda Meat Fuel day, and I will see you in my next video. SPG out.